for your word. Thank you, Father, for your mysteries, Father. Open up our minds and help us understand deeply. And Lord, just give us wisdom and lead us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. Excited about this one? I'm super excited about this one. Um, I've been trying to teach this lesson for I don't know how many years. I taught this lesson a while back um, at a little bitty retreat. And then I never got to teach it again. It's a long time ago. And, um, man, this is another one that's going to mess up your doctrine. I'm excited about it. <laughs> um, when I was, when I graduated high school, I went on my very first mission trip to Ukraine. And in Ukraine, I had this revelation before I read any of the scripture. Okay, God was doing this to me um, in high school. He'd start showing me things, and then next thing you know, uh, I'd find them in the Bible. It would be crazy. I'd, be, I'd get some sort of revelation and then read it. Some sort of revelation and then read it. And this is one of those things. <clears throat> Here's the epiphany that I had. Pretty much, we heard all of our life, God gets all the glory. God gets all the glory, right? It's all for the glory of God. So every good thing and every bad thing pretty much was all for the glory of God, okay? Um, which also meant that God ordained everything that happened because it was going to bring him glory. Um, and, you know, it was, you know, it seemed like a, a nice thought, but there was one problem was that it really made God look very selfish. And... I had this revelation in, in, when I was in Ukraine that I thought to myself, so God gets all the glory. And I thought to myself, what does he have? What, 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 what's the point of the glory? What's the point? You know what I realized? We were fashioning God after ourselves. We seek all the glory. And we think God seeks all the glory. You know? <laughs> and it hit me. What if what if God's not like us? <laughs> or maybe we have a misunderstanding of how this works. Because I thought to myself, what is it? What is the glory? Like what's the point in the glory? Why do we have the glory? Like, is it even meaningful? What what's the point? You know, like what value is there in glory? I mean, we're told that we have to get rid of our glory. So, what's the point, you know? Of course, then I also remember hearing about how Jesus stepped down from glory. I remember hearing that, that Jesus stepped down from glory to came to earth, humbled himself to become a man, right? And I realized that um, there was a part of God that people weren't really talking very much about, okay? And here's what I thought. Here's literally the imagery that I had in my mind. Is God in heaven and we're sending glory to him and then he has this big treasure box and it just gets stored up inside you know like the glory just keeps coming and he fills up this box this treasure box full of glory and then what it just sits there pointless and meaningless and I thought to myself that doesn't sound like God God is the creator of life he's always giving and I thought to myself, this is what I thought to myself. I thought, if God is really truly seeking all the glory, then there's only one reason, and that's if he wants to give it back. Now, when I said that in my heart, and I thought that out loud, and, you know, I said it out loud, and I didn't have anybody to go to to talk right. to about this. But it hit me. I thought to myself, is God selfish? The Bible says God is love. God is love. <clears throat> and love doesn't seek its own way. <laughs> According to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? Love does not seek its own way. Now, I went on this journey at this point trying to think of trying to understand God in the light of his love. Okay? 
and this was good and bad, okay? I went so far into thinking, you know what? God doesn't seek his own way. He's totally selfless. He doesn't think about himself. He only thinks about others, right? Because God is love, right? I went so far onto this that I actually had a hard time believing that God punished sin, which would be contradictory to the Bible. But I'm just telling you my journey, okay? I went to down, so far down this road that I thought that God didn't, even want to punish sin and it actually caused me to wonder if I would even spank my own children when I, when I became a parent because I thought to myself if God is all love you know then then why would he you know do this right of course thank God they gave me greater wisdom <laughs> because I realized God isn't just love he's also just mm -hmm. right which is love he, God, God defends the weak, which means he'll punish Satan, right? So I thought to myself, if he's capable of punishing Satan for oppressing me, right? I would want him to punish Satan, right? Because he's the, my oppressor and the one who tempts me to sin, and I want my enemy to be, you know, to be event, you know, to be killed, you know, to be destroyed, right? Because he's leading me into this sin, right? So I knew that God, something about me knew that God would punish sin. He has to punish sin or I can't get set free, right? And so I went down these roads of just discovery. And thank God I found some balance and realized that if God's righteous, he's going to punish sin. Which means if I'm going to be like God, I also have to punish sin too. You know what I mean? At the same time, I have to show mercy because God's a merciful God, right? God's merciful, I should be merciful. So <clears throat> I did find balance on that. I'm just telling you my journey. It, it took me so far to the other end that I really started to delve into what true love was and which actually was huge for me because it taught me how to love. When I realized how loving God was, think about this. There's a truth in the fact that God doesn't punish sin. He does punish sin, but he doesn't punish sin, right? <clears throat> what, is it, what do I mean by that? God loved us so much that he removed our punishment by taking the punishment for himself. That's how selfless God is. Does that mean he doesn't punish sin? No, he does punish sin. So he punished himself, right? Anyone who doesn't receive that will also be punished for their sin, right? Because you can't just remove punishment for sin, right? Altogether, otherwise God wouldn't be a just God. It's actually his love that causes him to punish sin. That's what the Bible says, for the, love, for the Lord disciplines those he loves, right? And if a, a father hates his child, if he doesn't spank him, right? If he doesn't, uh, if he withholds the rod, he hates his child, the Bible says, right? So I was reading these scriptures and I'm trying to find balance, right? So anyway, I went down this whole journey of like, well, what is God just seeking his own glory? Like he puts everything in a box and it hit me. All of this hit me, okay? When I was in Ukraine and I thought to myself, God must be giving it back somehow. Because if God is selfless, he wouldn't be a hoarder of glory. Whatever that is. I didn't even know what it was. So I read uh, Exodus. So let's go over here. Well, well, first of all, the scripture we use all the time for why God doesn't give anyone any glory, it's all about him, is Isaiah 42. It says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to anyone else, nor share my praise with carved idols. Well... Then you read Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So here's what I realized. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, we know sin's a problem. Are we, are we willing to admit that falling short of the glory of God is also a problem? And th this started me down a road of discovery what really the glory is. What is the glory? Why do we need the glory? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. It's actually a bad thing for me to fall short of the glory of God. Well, then what about Isaiah 42 verse 8? I just love it when people take scriptures out of context. <laughs> they're, they're easy to debunk. This one's a little harder to debunk. <laughs> Let's go over to Isaiah 42 real quick. Get some context. Verse 42, chapter 42, verse 1, it talks to it says, Look, look at my servant whom I strengthen. He is my chosen one. 
who pleases me. I have put my spirit upon him. Who's that sound like? Jesus. Sounds like Jesus. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who have get, who have been wronged. He will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails throughout the earth. Even distant lands beyond the sea will wait for his instruction. For the Lord created the heavens and stretched them out. He created the earth and everything in it. He gives breath to everyone. Life to everyone who walks the earth, and it is he who says, I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. I will take you by the hand and guard you, and I will give you to my people, Israel. Give who to my people? Give this servant. I'm going to give this servant to my people, Israel, as a symbol of my covenant with them. And you will be a light to, the gu to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison. Releasing those who sit in dark dark dungeons. Watch this. I am the Lord. This is my name. I will not give my glory to anyone else. Do you hear that? Yeah. What's he talking about? Does that mean he's not giving his glory away? It's actually the opposite. He's talking about this servant. I think we're misunderstanding this passage. Like anyone else besides Jesus. And I'm not going to give my glory to anyone else but this servant. If we're the righteousness Watch this. I will not give my glory to anyone else, nor share my prayers praise with carved idols. This scripture is directly related to other gods, not people. He's saying, I'm tired of sharing my glory with these other gods you're worshiping. good stuff huh mm -hmm. everything i prophesied has come true and now i will prophesy again okay so <clears throat> good stuff all right let's go to romans chapter 3 verse 23 it says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god so we know that falling short of the glory of god is a problem which means if god rescues us from our sin he would also restore something about his glory okay so now the big question what is god's glory let's go over to exodus chapter 33 verse 18 <clears throat> Moses said, <clears throat> please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness. There you go. What's the, what is the glory of God? <laughs> God's glory is not worship music. You're not going to give God glory by praising him with your lips. In fact, God despises praises with lips and no walk to back up your talk. He says, I don't desire praises, I, you know, and sacrifices. Where's that scripture? I do not desire sacrifice. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, that's when Saul spared this. First Samuel 15. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. This is so good. Mercy. This is why in Isaiah 58, I think, he says, Is this a fast that's pleasing to the Lord? That you, that you humble yourselves and pray and lift up your voices to me? Isn't this the, the fast that I want? To give your clothes to the naked? To feed the hungry? Mercy. What pleases God is mercy. What pleases God is mercy. The only thing that brings God glory is mercy. How do I know that? Let's go back over here. For I will make all... Watch this. Hmm. I will make all my goodness pass before you... And will proclaim my name, the Lord. So God's glory, okay, is his goodness and his name. You see that? Show me your glory. He says, show me your glory. He says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. 
And another one is like the actual name of God, right? What's the difference between glory and splendor? I don't know. Probably different. I don't know either. But, I don't know. I mean, is there a scripture you want me to... I don't know. Maybe we can just look at the definition. All right. Then. We'll look it up. Um, remind me. Remind me. Um, but splendor could be just all his, you know, radiant like light, brilliance, you know, like brilliance, his goodness, you know. But people think about glory and they just think about a shining light. But, but I think the shining light is a, is a symptom of what's actually the glory. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. It's the manifestation of God's glory. But God's glory is his goodness right here. I will proclaim, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. Watch this. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Isn't that interesting? He is correlating his glory with goodness, his name, and grace. Watch this. So good. The God's glory equals God's goodness. His name, grace. I will be gracious to him. I gracious to him. I'll be merciful. God's uh, glory is all of these things: His goodness, His name, His grace, and His mercy. This is the glory of God. <laughs> Exodus chapter thirty-four, verse five through eight says, "The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with them, with him there." Proclaim the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. <laughs> That'll trip you up. But who will by no means clear the guilty. It's like, hold on a minute. I thought you just said you were merciful. Why aren't you clearing the guilty? Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on children and children's children to the third and fourth generation, and Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. That's the proper response. <laughs> right? <laughs> but by no means will clear the guilty. That is that that right there puts a wrench in my gears. I'm like, what in the world? I remember reading this and thinking to myself, we're all messed up. We're all screwed up. But something's wrong. We're, we're, it's, we, there's no hope. You know what I mean? Like, we're all guilty. We're all guilty. So what's the answer here? Well, first of all, just to, I'm going to fast forward it to the right answer to, to help us clear it up so I can get the rest of these scriptures. Even though we could hold it out. <laughs> He's merciful. The Bible says merciful and steadfast in love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. If you go back up to Exodus chapter 13, 33, verse 19, it says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I'll proclaim my name and I'll be gracious and I'll be merciful. The first thing that he, he, he does, grace and mercy, notice, come after his goodness and after his name. Okay? Why is this important? God's goodness. God cannot allow sin. Right? If you're, if you're good... If you're the protector of your home, are you going to allow a robber to come in and, and, and hurt your children? No. You're good. If you're good, that means you're going to protect the, the weak from evil. Does that make sense? That's his goodness. That is God's goodness. His name. What does his name have to do with? Why does he talk about his name? Reputation. God has a good reputation. God has a good reputation. This is very, very important. If God doesn't have a good reputation, then there's actually repercussions for something else that we're going to talk about. Remember this. Hold on to this. He has a good reputation. Don't let me forget this if I don't talk about it again, okay? God has a good reputation. <clears throat> How does God... Get away with forgiving people of their sins. Let's go over to Romans. Uh, oh, here, okay. In his Let's 
Romans 3.25. <clears throat> For everyone has sinned. We all fall short. Verse 23. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. This is how God can not clear the guilty. How does God not clear the guilty? Someone else pays for it. Okay? Sin is still punished in Christ. The whole world is punished in Christ. The whole world is judged in Christ. Okay? For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin, people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. Did you know that the blood of Jesus covered David's sin? This is why God could look at David and not kill him right away. Because he was looking for someone who was humble and had faith. The people in the Old Testament got saved the same way you get saved. The Bible says that Abraham's righteousness, was con his faith was considered righteousness. The so people in the Old Testament got away with their sin because of Jesus. This is what he says right here. Let's, I'm going to pull that scripture up for you so you can see it for yourself. Uh, <clears throat> Romans. Verse 23. <clears throat> for God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for his sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair. Does that make sense? So what people do is they read they read the Old Testament and they say, how, how did he allow those sinners to get away with what they do? You know, the next time an atheist asks you, well, what about why did God allow that to happen? Because God desires that none should perish. He does, desires that none should perish. <clears throat> One second, guys. He desires that none should perish. If God was to judge sin right now, everybody would die. Like, people will misunderstand that. They want God to be just and fair. No, you don't. You want him to be merciful. So if you, <laughs> as Todd White says, if you, if you go ahead, if you want to get what you deserve, go to hell then. You know? <laughs> this sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to, de to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Look at this. To demonstrate God's righteousness, his reputation hinges on his righteousness. If Jesus didn't pay the penalty for sin then we would be able to look at God and say, you're an unjust God. And who do you think stands before God and does, and does that? <laughs> Satan. Right? Think about it. Righteousness. Does it make sense? What I'm saying? Everybody following me? Yeah? So he's made... He, God, his righteous reputation is hanging in the balance. Okay? His name. Reputation. What are you known for? Okay? So if, I remember reading this um, one article uh, in a book one time about a guy whose last name was Coors. And he was getting married to this woman. And she's going to take on his name. Right? And so she had to think about the reputation of his name. I wonder if I should get married to this guy. Everybody's going to think about beer whenever we get married. You know? <laughs> right? You see a, a name and you auto, it automatically has a stigma. Does that make sense? God also has a stigma with his name. God has a reputation. That's why when he died on the cross, he made himself right. Does that make sense? How can God love sinners? Because he paid the right to, he paid for the right to do it. 
He became the curse. He became the curse. He became like us. Whoa. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 or 19. Let's just go there. Either way, Christ's love controls us since we believe. Says he died for everyone so that those who received his new life will no longer live for themselves and said they will live for Christ who was raised. It goes down here and it says, For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for... Actually, I don't like this translation. I prefer... This one. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you know that you're the righteousness of God? You're God's righteousness? Mm. Why does God have to punish sin? God has to punish sin because it makes him righteous. So what did he do in order to, to not have to punish sin? He took the penalty for us. This kept his name good. If he allowed sinners to go free, he would be a corrupt judge. Think about that. What if a police officer was on the street and they knew somebody was a crook and they never arrested him? Right? How would we feel towards that guy? We'd think that the government was corrupt. Mm -hmm. How does God maintain his righteousness and not be corrupt, yet at the same time show mercy to sinners? Because he paid the fine for them. He paid the penalty for their sin. This makes his name good. It's not that he was merciful that, showed, that made him good. It's that he was just that made him good. Think about this for a minute. What made Christ, what made God good wasn't the fact that <laughs> it wasn't the fact that he showed you mercy. It was actually the fact that he enforced justice. On himself. On himself. He paid the penalty. He never ever con contradicted his word. Someone had to pay. So what this does is it reaffirms his name. It gives God a good reputation. Why is it so important that God gets all the glory then? Like the, glo the glory has to do with his name, right? It's important that his name stays good. His name doesn't have any taint to it. His name doesn't have any bad reputation with it. Why? Why is it so important that God upholds his name? Is it for his own sake? Is it because he's just selfish and wants to have a good name? It says, verse 1, for our sake. For our sake. He made him to be no sin. For our sake, he made him to be sin. So, here's what happens. When you get married, a wife takes on the name of her husband. If the husband doesn't have a good name, she inherits a bad reputation. So, why is it so important that God upholds his own name? Because he's going to give it to you. <laughs> So, Zach, are you saying that God gives us glory? Absolutely. I was about to say, are you trying to say, like, we are his glory? We are his glory. We're his goodness. We're his righteousness. My Lord, the glory set before him, he endured the cross. Whoa. What is it? Shame. Great verse. Hmm. Say that again? That's it. For the glory Moses. set before him, Hebrews 12, 1. Wow. Hold on, hold on, hold on. For the glory... Set before him. Oh. He endured the cross. Hebrews twelve twelve. Twelve two. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings to so closely let us, let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, oh, wait a while, maybe, maybe, the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. He by no means clears the guilty. This is so important. God cannot clear the guilty. Because if he clears the guilty, then he doesn't have a good name anymore. So he punished his sin. He himself came and died for us so he could uphold his good name so he could give it to us. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this teaching blessed you and, and inspired you and helped you out a little bit. Man, if, the, if it was a blessing for you, please uh, share the video, like it, leave a comment if you have questions. I'll be, I'll try to answer these questions and whatnot. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Go to our Facebook page and make sure you've already liked the page. Hover your mouse over following and make sure see first is checked. If there's a check mark there, then you know that you'll be seeing our videos in your newsfeed. Also, if you're wanting to support our ministry and help fund missions work and help uh, support drug and alcohol recovery, please go to our website, boldestalignedministries.com or www.balmzs.com and you'll see here there's a donate button. You just hit this donate button right there. It'll give you an opportunity to, to sow into the ministry. Right there, you can see Boldest Align Ministries. You can give 30 bucks a month, $50 a month, or $100 a month, or just a one-time gift if you want. Also, you can go to our website, 3rcandles.com. Remember, all the candles are handmade by our students in recovery, and so you can select from our wide range of products. I mean, we just have tons of candles, you can see right there. And also, be sure to sign up for the VIP offers. We can get 25% off your next purchase. You'll be able to receive offers we have. We're also gonna be doing some free test strips for fragrance as well so make sure that you sign up right here and, and all that good stuff so have a good day